Last week, when I uh, mentioned that we were going to be celebrating our 10th anniversary in this building, um, I, I heard a lot of comments <laughs> that were along the lines of, uh, 10 years? Are you kidding? How could it be that long? It seems like it was only yesterday. And that, I guess that's kind of another way of, another way of saying, you know, I, I can't possibly be 10 years older, can I? It doesn't feel like it. But 10 years it has been. It's true. April 20th, 2003, which was Easter Sunday that year, that was the first official Sunday at this location. Now, Unity of Auburn's been around since the 1930s. And, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but that Sunday in April, I believe, marked the first time that this community was meeting in a place that they owned, which is, a, which is, a, which is quite, quite, a, uh, quite an accomplishment. I mean, talk about, talk about expanding your vision. You know, you don't go out and buy a building and move and remodel it on a whim. You don't do something like that without having a strong sense of, um, I think, necessity, number one. You need a strong sense of your own identity. You need a shared vision. You need a purpose. Some would say it might help to be a little bit crazy. <laughs> because there, there's, there's a leap of faith involved in this. Or, or as I like to put it, a leap of, of trust. You do your homework. You're informed, you've got your map all laid out, everything is, everything is planned, but there's always, always, always that one step out of the familiar and into the great unknown. All of those years, renting space over at the Auburn Folsom location, and then it all had to change. You know, there's nothing wrong with renting space but it does involve a lot of inherent uncertainty, if any of you have ever, have ever been there. During the boom times of the 90s, rent increases were fast and frequent. Sometimes there's this possibility that the owner might want to sell the property, and they might want to sell it to someone who's not interested in using it for rental space. And you're out, and usually not on much notice. And, uh, and just to put things more into perspective here, when it, when it comes to um, commercial real estate especially, renting is a lot more expensive than owning. E even in today's commercial rental market, it's not what it used to be, but even at today's rates, if we wanted to rent the space that we use and occupy here as Unity of Auburn, we'd have to pay somewhere around $10,000 per month plus operating expenses, insurance, maintenance. They call it a triple net lease and uh, it's, it's pretty expensive. Our monthly mortgage payment, because we own this building, is $2,400. That is a bargain. And that's something I keep telling myself over and over again every time a toilet backs up <laughs> or a light goes out or something else breaks. I, yeah, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't have to do it all. We have lots of people here who, who step up and help with the maintenance, but if it happens during the week <laughs> and I happen to be here, well, or Karen and I happen to be here, she's changed her fair share of uh, toilet paper rolls and things like that. If we're here, we have to do it, and, uh, and it's worth doing it. It's well worth it. You know, th th those of you who went through the process of getting here, I I'm sure you remember Wayne uh, talking about building your field of dreams. I know that's a theme that, uh, that Wayne loves. And uh, you, you remember that movie, Field of Dreams? Oh, yes. Yeah. The Iowa farmer named Ray who heard a voice saying, if you build it, he will come. And then later on it changed to, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, the voice was asking him to do something kind of crazy. To tear out valuable farmland and build a baseball field. Now, Ray, Ray wasn't a guy who had always dreamed of building a baseball field. He never wanted to own a ballpark. He loved baseball. But what he really wanted to do was be a farmer, not the owner of a ballpark. 
So the voice speaks to him, tells him to build it, and at first he had no idea what it was all about or who was going to be showing up or anything like that. He said, he said I'm 36 years old, I love my family, I love baseball, and I'm about to become a farmer. But until I heard the voice, I've never done a crazy thing in my whole life. That's what it felt like to him. And it turns out it wasn't so crazy after all, because this field of dreams became a place of healing. It became a place of inspiration for thousands of people who had lost some kind of a connection with the simplicity and joy of their youth. The healing started with Ray and his long dead father, which was something he never expected when he decided he was going to listen to the voice and hear its guidance. The field of dreams wasn't something that Ray wanted to do. It was something he had to do. It was an imperative. He had been seized by a big vision, and that vision was pulling him along, and it was a big one. So it was a big vision for Unity of Auburn to have the security and the flexibility of being in a building that we own, but that's not enough. Security, comfort, flexibility, all great things. But it has to be leading to something more. A truly compelling vision is about something more than just comfort and self-interest. Instead of providing only security and comfort, a truly compelling vision is going to propel us out of our comfort zone. You know, I've, I've, I've heard the stories. And those of you who were here during the transition, you lived through it, you know what I'm talking about. Letting go of the old, embracing the new. Would people leave? What would become of our stained glass window? Then there was the time when y'all were doing something that we very affectionately in ministry call church in a box over at the high school auditorium for a period of time. And uh, the comment I recall hearing the most is that it was kind of cold over there. And um, it was a real challenge to provide continuity for the youth education program because the facilities just weren't there to do that. So out in the cold, looking at things changing, and in the meantime, the remodeling goes on, and anyone who's done any kind of remodeling knows what a grand adventure that is, right? <laughs> Lots of surprises, some of them pleasant, but more often than not, they're, they're not so pleasant and probably, <laughs> probably expensive. And I think the reason that this came to be, that 1212 High Street came to be, is because Wayne and Janet were holding the vision that this was going to be something that's way beyond just having a place to call our own. That's nice, but it's more than that. And when you think about it, the address here itself is auspicious, is it not? <laughs> yes. 12, 12 High Street. How the heck did that happen? You know, earlier this month, we, uh, we completed our Bible interpretation class, and one of the things we learned is that the number 12 appears over and over again in both the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. It's a, it's a symbolic number with some really deep meaning. 12 means spiritual power. It means authority. It means completion. It means perfection. Our address, 12, 12. It's a lot to live up to, isn't it, when you think about it? And here we are on High Street. Very appropriate, right? Because one of the things we do here is we're building consciousness. We're seeking higher consciousness. So even the address of this building is something that keeps our vision focused on something that's beyond our own immediate comfort and self-interest. And of course, you know, it seems these days that every organization has a vision statement. And I'm not just talking about churches. You know, it might surprise you to learn that the corporate world has been into this whole vision thing for a lot longer than most churches and spiritual communities. And one of the things about the corporate world is whatever they do, it has to work. It has to be practical. And in unity, as you know, we're all about <coughs> practical. 
Vision is about the destination. Where are we going? What will the world look like if we've been successful in carrying out our mission? How will the world change for the better when we do what we've been called upon to do in the world? And, and here's the thing that most businesses aren't aware of. The reason that a big vision works is because it's spiritual. It's quite a blend. It's part of a process, a spiritual process, that we call visualization. It comes from our spiritual faculty of imagination. There's a book by uh, the late, great Eric Butterworth called Spiritual Economics, and he, uh, he calls it the law of visualization, and he quotes from New Thought pioneer Thomas Troward, who said, having seen and felt the end, you have willed the means to the realization of the end. That's what a vision does. See and feel the end, and you bring about the realization of that end. That's a big deal. We create the condition in mind that makes the result inevitable. And the way we create the condition in mind is by having a clear statement of the vision that we're bringing into reality. It's like using an affirmation. We affirm truth even before it comes into physical manifestation. Visualization precedes manifestation. But ultimately, there has to be some kind of action. It can't just stay a grand and optimistic vision. Technically, Wayne retired, but, um, <laughs> yeah, Janet laughs. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne is currently, well, in addition to now serving as the president of the Auburn Chamber of Commerce, is that correct? Right. Yeah. He is also the director of academic development and the senior course leader at the Academy for Coaching Excellence. That was an organization that was founded by uh, Maria Nemeth, and um, she wrote a book called The Energy of Money. And she has this, this great name, a great description for what happens when you get stuck in the dream realm, which is the land of the intangible, it's the land of the metaphysical, the land of dreams and visions. When you get stuck in the metaphysical, and that's where you are just dreaming your dreams, what she says is what happens is we metaphysical, <laughs> like a wet firecracker, a little smoke, maybe a spark, a little flame, nothing, right? So the vision is no good without authentic action. That's the other piece that they brought to the picture here. You've got to have a grand vision. You have to have authentic action. And, of course, action is authentic when it flows from our deepest values and our deepest understanding of truth instead of from our ego-driven need to be right or to be admired or to hear things that we've always, always wanted to hear. Action is authentic when it flows from our knowledge of truth. And the most important truth for us in unity is that every person is the Christ in expression and deserves to be treated that way. That's our translation of the golden rule. It's the foundation of our vision statement that we share now, centered in God. We co-create a world that works for all. We have to recognize that we are all manifestations and perfect manifestations of the Christ in expression. And I want to thank Wayne and Janet this morning for discerning a big vision and then allowing that vision to propel them, and everyone here really, propel them into an authentic action, for taking the authentic action that prevented the dreaded meta-fizzle. Because... <laughs> Here we are, 10 years later, we're going strong, we're building on that vision. This is our home, but this building is not only home to Unity of Auburn. We have three 12-step groups that meet here and call it home. We have the Center for Visually Impaired Adults that meet here and call it home. It's a very important meeting place for those folks every week. We have a thriving thrift store that serves the community. We have five therapists upstairs who serve the community. We have our newest addition, which is the Spirit Wind program, which is ex exploring spirituality from multiple perspectives. That serves the community. So we're truly 
blessed to be here. And in a few moments, I'm going to invite Wayne up here to share a few thoughts about the uh, experience of uh, transforming and getting into this building. But first, I want to show you a little slideshow that uh, Karen created. When we got here almost uh, nine years ago now, there was this huge box of photographs that had albums in it going all the way back to, I don't know how far back, but... Um, <laughs> I want to thank Richard Payne for taking those photographs and digitizing them to make it a lot easier to work with. And uh, so here's a, a slideshow showing uh, 10 years at 1212 High Street. Well, many of you will remember what the building looked like before now, and many of you will not, will not have a clue of what they had to do to get this building uh, to what it is today. And even since it was created, there has been many changes. Uh, the ceiling went from black to white. Uh, the bookstore moved downstairs. And now it's a thrift shop. So we've had a lot of different changes, but that's the way of things. We have a mural in Manning Hall. And so, there's lots of things that have uh, changed. We've had a few roof leaks, <laughs> sewage leaks. <laughs> we've had to have, we had a few floods. We've had a lot of carpet cleaning. And, uh, so, but we've had a lot of helpers making the changes, putting up the shelves, many, many volunteers. So here we go. That is uh, Auburn Folsom location where you s started off. And there's the temporary digs at the high school. Remember those? And you're gonna see some a lot of people that are still here, some people that aren't, some people that visit occasionally, and some have made their transition. That's the way of life. And there's Wayne looking at the stained glass over there at the Folsom location going, what the heck and how are we going to do this? Still checking it out. And there's Gene Halverson and I don't know who all the people are, but, uh, and there's Gene Halverson uh, beginning to take the stained glass out. This was a major, major event to get it in here. And there they go. They're loading it up um, in the truck bringing it into this building, setting it up, setting it in place. There it is, looking pretty, you did it! <laughs> and there's uh, Randy Wall. Wall. He was, he's an engineer and he was a big part of helping design this whole place and making sure that the bearing walls and all that were uh, worked with. So there's him and Wayne. And that's the sanctuary. That's the PowerPoint uh, frame right there. There it is again, getting a little closer and the beams up in the ceiling and all that. There's somebody putting some drywall up. There it's looking more closer to finish. That's the foyer as you walk out right there. Can you imagine how, look how blank it was with all the just, I think that you pretty much gutted the whole thing, right? And there's upstairs in the hallway, the foyer, working on the floor. And I think that's the bookstore. Looks like the window going out front, so I have a feeling that's the bookstore. Now the thrift shop. And there is some people checking out the progress. Joyce McClellan. Yeah, Joyce McClellan. Keith yeah. McBee and Spiro. Oh, okay, Spiro. Oh, yeah. And there's Jerry Walker doing the landscape. There's Lynn Laney doing some more landscaping. And here's the sign, here we come, coming soon. And there's Richard Payne working on the planters. I don't know what that's doing in there. <laughs> Anybody know why that's in there? That's Wayne's car. <laughs> I know that's Wayne's car. 
And that, I think, is the office upstairs. I had kind of a hard time not being a builder myself, but I think those are the offices upstairs. And that's the kitchen. And there's uh, Brenda Rounds, Lynn Laney, and Jerry Walker taking a little break. I guess they got breaks. They must have had a union or something. And there's Patty McClure and Sawn Stone on the first day. Patty. <laughs> a little chunky. <laughs> Patty, you slimmed down. But I looked at pictures too when around when we first got here, and I have too. So. And there's Rose Purvis working on the sound back there. And there's opening day. I see Charlene Conley in there and uh, Carol Van Ness. Ron Fields, the builder, talking to Charlene. Oh, okay. And then there's Spiro. Keith Bigby. Keith Bigby. Here's another op that's an opening day. There's um, <coughs> Laura Musgrave. Um, uh, is that Glenn That is uh, Charlie. Charlie. That might be Glenn Rowe. Over by next to Janet. <coughs> he was uh, by That's the Bill Musgrave. Yeah, that's Bill Musgrave. Oh, okay. Oh, it's oh it is Bill. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Oh, and Billy. There's some more pictures. Pat, the LUTs at that time. Patty and Linda shoots. Linda made her transition. There's Dan at your new office. She got on her head. <laughs> It was Patty and her kids. <laughs> Always with candy on the. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the sanctuary complete. It's a little bit dark, but you get the idea. There's Manning Hall complete. There's Janet at the piano. <laughs> and there is Clint and Wayne and Janet playing. I think that's that's about it. We had uh, I had one other slide, but it's not there. So I just wanted to say uh, congratulations and uh, uh, to everybody. But I'd like to ask Wayne and Janet to come forward and just whatever you'd just like to add. Later and build them up. Speak mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And get that off the <laughs> I, have, I have to tell you what I just heard up here. Janet, Janet said he's going to speak for both of us, and he doesn't get that opportunity too often. So, uh, to make sure you all got that. That is, a, that is a time. Is, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much, uh, Karen. That's, it's just it's terrific to see that again. And, uh, you know, we're here because of an $80,000 airplane. Oh, wow. Nobody remembers that, but yeah. 30, 35 years ago or so, someone left the church an airplane in a, a state, a, a biplane. Oh. And uh, the people who were here then sold that airplane and bought 10 acres out on Auburn Folsom and Indian Hill Road when it was really in the country. A few years later, sold that corner five acres, which is now that wonderful office complex that overlooks the valley, kept the five acres up on the bluff, hoping for a future church home site. There and when we got here in 1999, uh, we still had that five acres. And as uh, Mark said, we're leasing property out at Maidu. And it was clear even uh, shortly after we got there that that was in a slowly deteriorating uh, circumstance out there, and the owners were not putting any money into it. And our lease was pretty uncertain, so we just decided after a while that we needed to be proactive and find us a permanent home. So we looked at a lot of things, a lot of things, and we found this building. Uh, which was owned by Bank of America. And before that, I believe it was a medical office building and Patty's doctor was here, right? I worked, I worked. You worked here? Yeah. My, so I Patty worked here. in this building uh, 20 years ago or more. Like, oh yeah, kind of like 20 years ago. <laughs> so, but we bought it from Bank of America and it was interesting because the Bank uh, of America headquarters in San Francisco bought this as a disaster recovery site. <laughs> If you are in the banking business and you have your headquarters in an earthquake-prone zone, you must have disaster recovery facilities somewhere out of the zone. 
So they bought this uh, and tore everything out and re rebuilt it as they wanted it, including when we first saw this, this room was filled with rows of desks and a computer on each desk. Back where the bookstore is now was a computer server room with air conditioning of its own and Halon and all that kind of stuff, very commercial uh, IT situation. Miles and miles of computer cable underneath the floor and posts everywhere. Posts right down the middle of this room, for example, as well, which are gone now, and I'll tell you about that in a second. So they had this as their disaster, because if, if they had a big deal in San Francisco, people would have come up here, activated those computers, and kept business going for the bank. And so the upstairs had been torn out but not refinished. Just this down here had been redone as office space or computer space. So that's what we saw. We knew we could make it work. The address was right, as Mark said, and we knew we could make it work. It's just going to take a lot of, uh, of imagining to do it. And so uh, we began that imagining process. And we've already celebrated some of the people who were here, dozens and dozens of people, uh, the Crozettis, the, uh, the Rounds, uh, the Walkers, uh, people that Patty and Charlene and many others that were here, and especially those who served on the board in those days. But there were a few roles that were critical, that they weren't but if those roles weren't filled, we wouldn't be here. Or at least it wouldn't be like this. It'd be something different. Because some things have to be done, you know, according to a certain standard when you're doing work like this. And we were so blessed to have people here who, in the congregation, who had those skills. A man named John Mastro Totoro came up from, from Christ Unity in Sacramento and became the architect who made this work on paper so that it would pass all the codes. Randy Wall, who you saw a minute ago, was the engineer. Randy figured out a way to take all these center posts out. You can imagine if we had posts there, it's not a lot of fun. And put in these massive headers that you see. He and Keith Bigby, the codes guy, figured out a way to jack this roof up, take those posts out, and put those headers in. I was scared to even walk in the room when they were doing that, but, but they made it work. So between John and Randy and Keith Bigby, uh, handling the architecture, the engineering, and the codes, they satisfied all those requirements and gave us the kind of space we needed. You saw a picture of Ron Fields a moment ago. Ron was a licensed contractor, so he became our general contractor, which saved tons of money because he was able to do it uh, really efficiently for us. And his right-hand man and partner in that was Gene Halverson, who's sitting back here. And between Gene and Ron, they did all of the finished work you see. You saw some pretty crude pictures of what it looked like. Yeah. Everything you see now, they, they did every wall, they hung every door, they did it all. They built the platform, built all of that. Everything you see upstairs is all uh, uh, Gene and Ron. And they did it all. Now, the, whole, the, the, the big deal is, this was going to cost... Yeah, yeah, there we have it. What's the only thing I haven't mentioned yet? It's Money. important. Money. <laughs> this whole thing was going to be about $750,000 to make happen. We had that property out on Indian Hill Road. It was going to cost a lot more than that to build a new building yeah. that would house the kind of operation we really needed and wanted to have. So we opted to sell that property, and now you see homes out there. And we got about, as I remember, something over 200000 for that. So we had about two -third, about one-third of the money that we needed. And then stepped forth from the crowd a man named Gary Croman and his wife Lois, and they carried the note for $500,000, and they carry it to this day, and made it possible for us to be in here, so that we had a private loan rather than having to go a public loan with a, with a much higher interest rate. I say all that just to say that when you do what Mark was talking about, when you dream the dream and then step out into the dream, and it's kind of like uh, 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 Paul, there's a paraphrase, that I'm not going to say the whole thing accurately, but Paul said, you know, when you step out into the unknown, it's a fearful step. Oh, I know the image. Indiana Jones and the Temple of, no, the Last Crusade. Remember when Indy, the only way to get to where the grails are is to step out into the chasm. And the only way he knew to do it was just to do it, and so he did it. And only then did the bridge appear. We did that. We, and that's what we have to do is step out into it. And so that story proves that what we talk about in unity does work. When we step out in faith, we can get the job done when we all do it together. Now, who knows if this is going to be the lifetime home of Unity of Auburn. I don't know. Uh, none of us do, really. But what I do know is right now it works. 
and it is a pretty good place on a practical level to park the asset that this church owns. Because if we could see um, appraisals over the last decade, we would see a, a scary dip in about 2008, 2009, 2010. It wasn't worth nearly what we even paid for it. But over the last few years, it's starting to come back up. And I think long term, we're going to see that this was a very smart thing that the church did 10 years ago, was to move here and own this property, which becomes an asset into perpetuity. So I'm grateful to have been a part of that. Janet is too. That was our, it was our point in history as we were here to be a part of this and to have the support of all the people who made it work. And we are so glad that it's in the hands it's in now as you keep moving forward into the future. So thank you all very much for allowing us to be here. Who, who had a role in, uh, in bringing us here. And uh, I know y'all had a, I saw a picture of a ribbon cutting, and when we looked at that ribbon cutting and we looked at the people, we said, I don't know a single person. That must have been the Chamber of Commerce <laughs> that came. Okay, oh, yeah. that, that explains it. The but Chamber there, Ambassadors. Right, there, was, there was a special ribbon cutting, and what we want to do today is we want to, to rededicate and, and, and bless this facility. So I'm going to ask you all to stand. And we are going to give our unity blessing yeah. to the wonderful place that is 1212 High Street. So we're going to say together, 1212 High Street, we love you, we bless you, and we behold all of these expressions of Christ <laughs> in you. How does that sound? All right, together. 1212 High Street, we love you, we bless you, we appreciate you. And we behold these expressions of Christ in you. Amen.